Here we go. So welcome everyone. We are delighted to have everyone of you here today to this very first installment of the VEGA seminar series. Um, uh, very brief introduction. My name is Simon Rue. I lead the viral genomics group at JGI. And today on behalf of the VEGA co-organizing committee, I really want to welcome you to this 2021 version, online slash virtual version of this viral ecogenomics and applications meeting. So this series of online seminar really stems from this VEGA workshop that we used to organize in person. We had the first one in 2018. We intended to hold uh, another one in 2020. Of course, this was all kind of swung out of the window. So we decided to pivot and make this or transform this two day workshop into a series of six online seminars. And this will run every Thursday from today to May 13th. The format we have decided to try is as follow. We have two main speakers per uh, seminar. You have the name of the two speakers of, for today's seminars here. In between, we have flash talks from submitted abstracts. And then following this webinar, what we call this breakout slash discussion session, which will be a separate Zoom meeting where you will be able as an attendee to talk and discuss directly with the presenters and between attendees. Now, I think that's all for the logistics. So I will now hand it over to Frederick Schulz to introduce the specific topic and speakers of today's seminar. Frederick. Thanks again, everyone, for joining. Uh, my name is Frederick Schulz. I'm also at the JGI, and I will moderate this session today. Um, in the next two hours or so, we will um, discuss exciting topics about viruses of eukaryotes. Um, we will not talk about SARS coronavirus 2. Um, I think that's actually in another session in, in a few weeks. Um, but instead, we will focus on viruses of micro eukaryotes. Uh, microbial eukaryotes, they play important roles in global nutrient cycles, and, and they are abundant and diverse. And so are their viruses. Um, once we start looking into a eukaryotic cell, we may encounter viruses um, ranging from smallest RNA viruses, encoding for just a few genes, um, to large DNA viruses, including giant viruses, of which um, yeah, many are basically record breaking with, with genomes that are in the megabase range and also their uh, variants of, can be of extreme size. So that, in fact, initially they were um, thought to represent microbes. Recently, several cool studies that focused on viruses of microbial eukaryotes came out. In, in particular, our first speaker today, Monia, has been pushing the field um, forward with intriguing discoveries. Um, Monia, um, Mohamed Moni Rusaman, he's doing his postdoc at Virginia Tech in Frank Iwas group. Um, before that, Monia did his PhD with Stephen Wilhelm at the University of Tennessee, um, where he already worked on algae associated um, large DNA viruses and looked into their genomes. Um, he then did his first postdoc in Alex Warden's lab in the uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. And from there, he moved on to um, Frank's group in Blacksburg, Virginia. Um, maybe it's worth to mention, but uh, Monia's Twitter handle is um, at giant virus, which is pretty cool. Welcome, Monia, and um, take it away from here. Well, uh, thank you, Frederick. That was very nice. You know, uh, I don't know if I deserve all those cool words, but uh, uh, I think I, I feel like I'm, I'm very fortunate to work with lots of cool people here and uh, be together with others. Um, like you in JGI and other universities who are really pushing this uh, giant virus field forward. And I'm very lucky to be a part of that uh, effort, I would say. Um, so can I share my screen? Oh, yes, please. Um, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I'll, um... OK, so. Today, I will certainly talk about giant viruses. Uh, my talk will be mostly focused on um, the work that I have done so far in Frank Aylord's lab in Virginia Tech. That's where I'm based right now uh, in the Department of Biological Sciences. I'm postdoc, a postdoc with him. So we'll be talking about the coevolution of giant viruses with their microbial eukaryote hosts in general. And um, on the screen, you can see a small cartoon on the right side that pretty much clearly tells you how big these viruses can be. They can be uh, 
you know, just to give a comparison, a comparison, the, let me see if I am missing something. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. I, um, so, we can hear you well. Hmm? Okay, okay, thank you, thank you. Um, so to give a brief brief idea, you can see the cartoon here. Um, it's the Mimi virus. That's like the hallmark giant virus that we talk about and how big it is compared to HIV or other small viruses. Um, in fact, uh, Mimi virus has a genome that's probably 1.2 megabits in size compared to the SARS-CoV-2 that we know of nowadays, uh, that's 30 KB. So, so that's that. Now, I know it's kind of funny here. So to just give an idea that um, what these viruses look like and how big they are. These are uh, officially or more scientific in terms, it's no, are known as nucleocytoplasmic large DNA viruses or NCLDVs. And from this Beatles work that the giant viruses are doing, with the E. coli, you can see that they're pretty big. They're actually almost as big as E. coli or some other small bacteria. Specifically, take a look at pythovirus or tupan virus. Uh, they're cool for sure, as you can see from the picture. And they're also enormous in size. So, and uh, you know, I mean, some of these actually, the genome size can up to be up to 2.5 megabit squares. That's pretty close to some bacteria. They have many genes um, in contrast to other uh, small viruses. They have a lot of genes in, in this, uh, from several hundred to several thousand genes, some of them can encode. And these genes have diverse evolutionary history. Some are actually coming from potentially from different bacteria. Uh, also their host eukaryotes and other diverse eukaryotes. Uh, many of the giant viruses, uh, for example, specifically this canonical Mimi virus, also the Pandora virus, Pythovirus. These viruses have been isolated using Acanthamoeba polyphaga as a bait host. So Acanthamoeba is a very permissive host that allows the scientists to actually isolate new giant viruses because apparently this amoeba uh, can be infected by viruses from very diverse phylogenetic groups. So this has been a really helpful and we have learned a lot about this uh, giant virus genomics, their lifestyle using Acanthamoeba as a permissive host. Now, what are the roles of these giant viruses? Um, as I talked about already, that they, they infect microbial eukaryotes mostly. However, some of them also infect uh, metagons, that is multicellular eukaryotes. They're associated with key photosynthetic and heterotrophic eukaryotes in diverse ecosystems that include marine and freshwater systems. Some of them are pretty well known given the fact that they actually modulate the dynamics of different algal blooms. For example, on the left of this uh, screen, you can see this satellite picture of Emiliana Huxley-I bloom. And um, you can see that this, uh, this coccolithopores, which is Emiliana Huxley-I, can be infected by the giant viruses that you can see attached here. I hope you can see my laser. And um, these viruses are thought to be responsible in collapsing these algal blooms. On the right, you can see a more smaller scale bloom. However, it's also very important because these are harmful algal blooms. Specifically, this is, this is the one that's called brown tide. And this happens every year on the, on the east coast of the USA. Uh, brown tide is caused by Oricoccus anophagiferens, a pelagopied brown algae. And you can see the AAV, the virus that infects this brown tide algae attached to one of these big cells here. Uh, my uh, PhD research was actually focused on this AAV Oricoccus system. Now going forward, given the fact that the, the first really hallmark giant virus was discovered and reported in 2003, it's a pretty new field and we have a lot of questions. Pretty much everything is open. I mean, all the questions that you can ask are not, have, they have not been worked out well enough to get a good idea of um, you know, the answer. For example, you can think about uh, the, even the diversity and distribution of these viruses is still, we're kind of still trying to figure out because uh, the different habitats, which habitat, you know, I mean, we know some of the stuff in the marine systems and freshwater, but there are lots of specific habitats like extreme environments we don't have a good hold of their diversity and distribution patterns. Uh, from an evolutionary perspective, why are the genomes so big? And where are the genes coming from? Why do they have bacterial genes, for example? We don't know, not yet. Um, so who are the potential hosts? 
at this point, it almost feels like we know more about the giant viruses than their hosts. So that's a big question, connecting the host and the virus. And also how they impact the host metabolism and what is their role in global biogeochemistry. And specifically another question that I am interested in is how are these NCLDV host interests that impact the host evolution? We know that this certainly impact the viral evolution because they have all these uh, crazy metabolic genes in them sometimes, but we don't know how that impact the host evolution. So specifically in ALOR lab, I am interested in this first and last question that I've put together here. One is uh, the diversity, distribution, genomic potential, and also understanding how they can impact the host genome evolution. I'll be talking briefly about question one here, very briefly, and we'll elaborate more, a bit more on this uh, last question. That is how does NCLDV host arm stress impact the host genome evolution? Moving forward, now, for when it comes to NCLDV diversity, the diversity in the environment, the big, there are some uh, questions and challenges. Uh, the first project that I started in Aylward Lab, um, at that time, there are like less than 100 known isolar giant viruses, excluding pox viridae. And I'll come back uh, to that later. Uh, so there's a very few uh, known host virus pairs that's in culture, that was in culture. And um, I hope, uh, you probably know that this, uh, lots of virome studies are done nowadays. So we want to understand the viral diversity from the metagenomic surveys of different environments. Now for the virome, usually we use the, the filtrate that goes through this really extremely small pore size that is 0.22 micron. And we investigate the filtrate to recover these viruses. Because uh, the idea is that the viruses are very small and they will pass through the filter, but not the cells. However, what happens is that um, this, you know that these uh, giant viruses are pretty big. So what happens is that they get excluded. They don't get through the pore and they don't get into the virome fraction. So basically what we're getting is a biased view of viral diversity because we are not accounting for the giant viruses in that virome studies. So given the fact we have been thinking about using the metagenomic surveys to actually get an idea of giant virus distribution, the genomics and the genomic potential. So what we thought is that if we look at the cellular size fraction where most of the bacteria are in these uh, in environmental samples, maybe we will know something. And for this project, uh, Alina and Carolina, they both are grad students in our lab and they're very excited about uh, viral and in general microbial evolution. And they made significant contribution in this project. So we leveraged uh, publicly available 8,000, um, this uh, about 1,500 metagenomes that was publicly available and was used in a previous study to actually detect and be in uh, bacterial genomes. So these are represent from different environments, for example, soil, freshwater, and marine systems. So we developed a pipeline to actually isolate the giant viral genomes from this data. We used the traditional metagenomic binning. However, we used uh, particular hallmark genes of giant viruses for quality filtration and also wanted to look at, make sure that we don't have any um, cellular contamination in the bins. And at least four out of the five giant virus hallmark genes in these bins. There were additional steps there, but I will not go into the details. So altogether, we eventually ended up recovering 501 new NCLDV genomes. Um, and that's, that's pretty much what I want to talk about here. And I'll directly go into the diversity that we recovered from this study. And this will also give us an idea, actually help us to see the historic perspective of these, uh, these large viruses, how things came to be as it is now and how it was like 30 years ago. So if you look at this tree here, uh, you can see this group, um, Picordinavridae, traditionally known to be infecting algae. These are pretty big viruses, but if you look at the size, they're in general smaller compared to other giant viruses in this tree. This is the tree that we constructed uh, for our study, and it has those 500 genomes and some of the reference genomes that are already available. So scientists know about these algal viruses uh, pretty early on, since 1980. Uh, they have been studying some of the algal viruses, like chloroviruses, for example. Uh, we also know about some iridoviruses that infect like metagons, like fish or other invertebrates. We know about the 
the famous African swine fever virus, Aspergillus. And uh, you know, until a few years ago, there's only one known member that was the African swine, swine fever virus in this Aspergillus group. And surely we all know about pox virus, the pox viruses that uh, cause human disease. And they are very basal branching. There's still NCLDV, uh, but you know, there's a debate about what is giant virus, what is not, right? So you can safely say that they are not, they don't belong to this giant virus like this uh, traditional term we use. However, phylogenetically, they're still related. Now, in 2003, Mimi virus was reported, and that belongs to this true giant virus category, that's a Mimi virus group here. And um, over time, 2009, we have Marseille virus, then we have Pandora viruses, which are really big, and those really uh, broke all the records about genome size, 2.5 megabase pairs. And then we came, uh, someone, some scientists, I don't know which, um, it was 2014, the was reported. So the bottom line is, we are actually getting this uh, very new view of diversity and that happened all in last um, 15 to 20 years. And um, in our study, we significantly expanded the known diversity of these viruses. And you can see that maybe viruses are really they really showed up, like they're really diverse and really uh, very common in specifically in marine and freshwater systems. Now, I have to say that this is not the only study that we, um, uh, ours is the only, only study. Uh, the idea that the metagenomes can be leveraged to get these giant virus genomes has been out there for a while. And um, specifically on GI, Frederick Schultz and his colleagues, they reported about 2000 new giant virus genomes about the same time we had our paper out. So that was a very significant development in the field. And at the same um, couple of years ago, uh, Disa Backstrom and our team, they reported this um, uh, metagenome assembled giant viruses from deep sea sediments. So this is, a, this is a new development, but there's a lot of potential to explore in this field. Now, moving forward to uh, the main uh, topic I wanna talk about, and I spent it quite a time in the previous project, but I'll try to go a little bit faster here. Um, so I am very interested in this idea that these uh, giant viruses, uh, their genome is shaped by their host genes. Some of the genes from the host go, um, are acquired by the viruses. However, the opposite also happens. Sometimes uh, we know from some previous studies that some of the hallmark genes of NCLDVs are present in eukaryotic genomes. So this is a both way thing, like um, the viruses are picking up host genomes and host is actually also picking up viral genomes, viral genes. Now the question is, what is the true extent of such, these are called endogenized viruses, endogenous viruses. So when it comes to these giant viruses, they have pretty big genomes. So what is the true extent of this endogenization? Do we only see like one or two giant virus genes going into the host genome or do we see a lot more? So that's the question that I wanted to explore in Edward Lab. And uh, for this purpose, we started to look at some genomes of eukaryotes that are known to be potential hosts of uh, different giant viruses. We particularly looked at green algal genomes uh, for several reasons. So green algal genomes, green algae is widespread in the environment. Some of them are known to interact with known NCLDVs. That's pretty common. Um, for example, Micromonas, Osteococcus, they are very widespread picoeukaryotes in the green algal group, and they interact with giant viruses. Uh, we also have a large number of publicly available green algal genomes. It's difficult to get um, good survey of genomes for particular eukaryotic group, but for uh, green algae, we had a good number actually in the public database. And um, initially, when we did, you know, when you do like a blast to search for specific giant virus genes, what I noticed is that they always show up in the blast search. These hits come up, so we get hits to other viruses, but we also get hits to eukaryotes, specifically green algae. So these all came together and I've decided to explore the green algal genomes for the signatures of giant virus genes. And that actually blew up on our face, which I'll tell the story later. So for this purpose, what we did is actually we took all the 65 genomes that was available at the time when I was started, starting to work on this project. Um, just to give a brief idea how we did this, we did the gene prediction. We developed a tool that's called uh, viral recall. 
So viral recall is specific. Uh, right now, the current version is very specific to giant viruses. It will try to identify potential contexts that come from giant viruses in any metagenomic or genomic data sets. So we used that uh, early version of viral recall and also did some manual curation uh, to detect smaller contexts in these genomes. As you know, that these genomes are extremely fragmented sometimes. Some of them are good quality, but some of them are very highly fragmented. So we wanted to make sure that we get all the contexts that potentially come from uh, different viruses in these genomes. So we approached, we did both manual curation and automated curation using viral recall. Uh, once we get a uh, initial set of contexts, we did binning based on tetranucleotide frequency. And after that, we came up with a filtered and quality check um, set of contexts that could be attributed to uh, viral origin. And you know, then that, came, and that actually went into uh, further phylogeny, functional profile, and other analysis. So to give a brief idea, this is what we found. If you look at this particular figure, uh, this is a genome that we recovered from Tetrabina socialis. This is a viral genome, and the outer circle has a location of spliceosomal introns. You have the VOG hits, that is the virus orthologous group gene hits in the next circle going in, uh, inside. These are the best, I would say, sort of blast hit, the homologous search hit. So these red are the hits to different, different giant viruses. And then further down, we have hits to bacteria and eukaryotes. The cords, the connections that you see, the blue connections, these uh, signify duplications within the, each of the viral bins. This particular bin is 1.9 kilobase pairs, almost as big as some of the giant viruses. They also have very high GC content. Um, some of them have lots of duplications, as you can see here. And um, in agreement with that, some of them also has multiple copies of core genes that are like duplicated, very similar copies. Now, all of this pointed to the fact that this is not a free virus. This is an endogenous giant virus. Specifically, the introns are really revealing. There's like hundreds of introns in some of these uh, viral, uh, viral beans. And it's very rare, almost absent, I would say, in the free giant viruses. Specifically, the spliceosomal introns are specifically eukaryotes. The fact that they're present in these uh, viral beans means that um, host introns are they have been uh, you know, in the process of being endogenized for quite some time. Going forward, we actually found two distinct viruses in Tetrabina socialis. You can see that uh, number one is 1.9 KB that I talked about before. And the second one is slightly smaller, but still pretty big, 1.2 KB. Similar features, lots of duplications, lots of introns. Uh, moving forward, this is Clamidomonosius stigma, another green algae. And we have, again, two distinct giant viruses in the same algae, same host. Um, similar kind of uh, features, although you can see that the duplication level is a little bit lower for this number three, and number, uh, number four has slightly higher duplication level. Now, eventually what happened is like, we detected these giant endogenous viral elements that we call GIVs in 12 of the 65 green algal genomes we surveyed. Uh, they're all pretty big. Uh, some of them are in several hundred kilo, uh, kilobase pairs, up to uh, anywhere from 400 kilobase pairs to 1.9 megabase pairs. Uh, the GC content varies. Some of them are pretty high. There's a lots of proteins they encode. And most of them has actually the near complete set of the NCLDV core genes. Um, I won't go into details, but each of these actually uh, represent one of the specific core genes. For example, MC is the major capsid. Uh, A32 is the A32 ATPase. These are hallmark genes of giant viruses. And many of them have some loss. You can see that uh, some of them are missing. But in general, they have they retained most of the core genes. So basically, what we are looking at is complete or near complete giant viral uh, genomes endogenized in this uh, um, in these uh, chlorophyte green algal hosts. Now, for some cases, we are being actually able to see the clear case of integration. We could see clearly that this um, endogenous giant virus is sitting right in the middle of an eukaryotic context. You can see that there's a big bump in red in both of these uh, chlorella and tetrodesmus context. This signifies the viral recall score as it detected more and more viral genes in this region compared to the eukaryotic regions 
that's flanking the region. And uh, in the negative axis, you can see that these are actually the deviation of tetranucleotide frequency from the host regions. So you can see that there's a big bump compared to the uh, host region. So you can see clear integration of some of the cases. And again, there are some cases, for example, we have higher intron density, which is, uh, I'm, I'm showing it as like a vertical stripes on the top, a higher number of viral hits, and also, um, so these also have like integrating, they have introns. However, the intron density is actually, it drops dramatically compared to the host regions, which is expected if you think that the introns invade these regions later, there will be less intron compared to the original eukaryotic regions. So all of this point together, this clear integration of giant viruses in eukaryotic genomes. Now, this is not the, I mean, this is, uh, I'm talking about the 12 of these, uh, 12 of these genomes. However, we also found that another 23 of these uh, algal genomes uh, have NCLDP marker genes, but not these giant elements. And all of the 65 genes that we surveyed had some kind of base state to NCLDVs, uh, telling us that there has been some kind of gene exchange, no matter what, it is a, a GIV or not, there has been some gene, gene exchange across almost all the chlorophytes that we surveyed. Um, at some point in the evolutionary history. Now, this is very consistent with the recent study that actually showed that not only chlorophytes, but many algal genomes have lots of viral genes in them. This study came in January, um, and I think that really um, strongly validates what we found. And I think, you know, together gives a comprehensive picture of the nature of these endogenous genes, viral genes in this algae, not only chlorophytes. Now, moving forward, I think it's very exciting in a sense that um, this kind of endogenization explains several things. Now, we know that these giant viruses already have genes. They're, they're kind of chimeric in nature, their genome. And they have genes from different bacteria. They have genes from other eukaryotes. And now that makes them, and the fact that they're endogenizing in these different eukaryotic genomes makes them a highway of gene transfer. They're actually getting genes from different sources and transferring those genes to their hosts, host genomes. So basically this at least partly explains lots of um, horizontal gene transfer in eukaryotic genomes. In my, you know, in my view, that giant viral integration might actually explain why we see many bacterial genes and can't really explain how these genes came in the eukaryotes. It's possible that giant viruses are transferring those bacterial genes in the eukaryotes. And that's certainly a future, uh, you know, like, um, a research frontier and lots of rigorous phylogenetics will be uh, needed. However, together, I think this, um, you know, putting the giant virus in the picture will clarify some of the scenario of uh, HGT in eukaryotes. Now, there's many outstanding questions. This, this study really opens lots of questions then answers those, you know. Um, certainly, what are these genes that the giant virus are bringing in in the, their host? What are they used for? Why do the eukaryotes, the chlorophytes retain these genes? What is the purpose? Now, some of these genes could be co-opted by the eukaryotic host for uh, beneficial purposes, which we don't know yet, uh, but it'll be interesting to look at some of these genes and see what they do in the eukaryotic host genome. Do they provide any fitness benefit, for example? Uh, how, are this, uh, how are these big viruses endogenized? What's the mechanism? Uh, transposons could be one possible way. Uh, repetitive regions that are common between the host and the viral genome might potentially facilitate this kind of integration. Um, and there could be integrases. Uh, but again, that has to be validated in the lab and has to be worked on a particular model system for that. Uh, do this uh, provide any, any benefit uh, against infection by other free NCLDVs? We don't know, but that's a potential avenue to explore. And another big question is like, do we see this integration happening recently or did it happen very ancient in the evolutionary history of eukaryotes? So these are all the outstanding questions that um, this GAV study that we did uh, opens up. Now, I think I'm kind of running out of time here. Uh, with that, I will conclude my talk here. And I'll really thank my lab. My lab members have been extremely supportive uh, during this difficult time that has been, we have been all facing. Uh, Frank is also very fun to work with, very excited about giant viruses, and I'm very fortunate to work with uh, this, you know, this inspired group of people.
Uh, with that, I'll take questions. Um, yeah, thank you, Mon. Thank you. Yeah, that was a great talk. Um, as as Mon said, we're open for questions on for discussion now. And then Simon mentioned it. Please um, post your questions in the Q and A. So just looking here, I don't see any audience questions right now yet. Um, maybe maybe I can just start with with one question. So you described this integration of um, NCLDB genomes in green algae and. I remember there were studies already like 1999 or like around the 2000s um, integration of FEO viruses in, in like brown algae. Right, um, right, yes. So, so how does it, does it relate um, to those? Like let's say phylogenetically the um, vi viral genes that you um, recovered from the green algae, how are they closely related? Would they group in the same plate with the FEO viruses? And... Um, uh, not exactly, they're very close. Um, we, we recovered four of the uh, four of the JIVs that we call giant endogenous elements. They belong to the Phycoordina viridae group. The few viruses are actually um, uh, they are actually in the Phycoordina viridae, but they don't belong to the same subtype that I can tell. Uh, and the few virus integrations are actually specific. That's part of the lifestyle of the virus because they integrate in the host genome and then they will uh, produce their own progeny uh, without killing the host. However, for this particular kind of integration, we believe this actually became a part of the host genome and kind of telling that it does have, in effect, become the host become a chimeric genome, in effect. And we don't think they produce any live, I mean, any viral progeny in the process. Thank you. That, that, so that makes sense. Thanks. I, we can discuss more detail, but I think, yeah. So, Sounds good. Yeah, I think we have some more um, questions from the audience now. Um, let, let's start uh, um, from the top. So, can I, so Monia. Um, can I, do, do you think yeah, it's yeah. possible that some of these questions from Jill Myers, um, I think from, from Jill, yeah, yeah. do you think it's possible that some of these endogenous algal viruses are exogenous at some point in the replication cycle, um, similarly to Phycotna viruses? Okay, we all kind of talked about right. it a little bit just now, but. So, um, yes, um, I think um, I, uh, based on the fact that they have lots of introns, specifically spliceromal introns in them, and for uh, we, uh, we checked, six of these uh, GIVs for ex uh, like expression of capsid proteins and DNA polymerase. The, and we did not really find any kind of expression in the, at least the current data. I mean, we cannot completely exclude the possibility that at some point of the host life cycle, maybe during under stress or something, uh, uh, they might have a role, but if they produce like viral progeny, uh, all evidence is actually to the contrary, I would say. Uh, in contrast to few viruses, yes. Right, that, that sounds good. So let's move to the next question. Um, that's from Severin. Um, so Moni, how confident um, are you that the virus integrated genomes are genuine um, rather than chimeric misassemblies? Um, we are uh, we are pretty confident, um, I would say, uh, based on the evidence for sure. I mean, we're not like certainly just confidence is not, you know, we need evidence. Um, so particularly, as I said, that they have a lot of introns. They have a lot of introns in them, uh, specifically the eukaryotic specific uh, lysosomal introns, which is very rare, almost absent in free giant viruses. They have lots of duplications. Uh, we have benchmarked that against reference viruses, and we believe that most of these have a higher level of duplication compared to the free viruses. Uh, there are other evidences. The GC content is pretty high, uh, almost very similar to the host. So. And certainly, some of the introns are also shared with the host loci. Uh, some of the genes are shared, uh, very similar genes, 95% or more. So all of these evidence together actually give us a strong confidence that these are actually part of the host genome, not free viruses or misassemblies. Very good. Um, so let, let's take the next question. That's from um, Guillermo um, Dominguez, Huerta. Um, Monia, did you see bacterial genes incorporated in NCDB genomes? Um, if so, how can you explain it? So uh, for this particular study, we have not uh, really, um, you know, we have not done like a detailed phylogeny. However, we have actually found, um, yeah, lots of genes that have best hits to bacterial genes. And that is consistent with what you see in free giant viruses, uh, you know, uh, 20% or 30% genes that have hits in giant viruses usually come from bacteria. And we do see the same kind of enrichment in these regions. So that tells us that these are actually, you know, 
basically what's happening is that when a genome of a giant virus integrates, it integrates with whatever it has. So it reflects the, the characteristics of what you expect in a giant virus. So yes, we have seen lots of bacterial bits in it. Right. I, I think we can still take one or two more questions. And um, one is from Andrian um, Gajigan or so. And see that uh, was a great work on um, morning. So, um, just wanted to get your thoughts on uh, whether you think this endogenous or viruses will confer resistance to NCLDV infection, or generally, how will endo endogenous viral elements affect host virus interaction? That's that's a good question, and that's certainly an open question. I have uh, you know mentioned the question in the last part of the talk. Um, I believe it's a possibility. Uh, however, it, I mean we can't say that specifically. I mean it's very possible that they are not conferring any resistance. Uh, however, I believe that there has been some work in moss, if I'm not wrong, uh, maybe, yeah, uh, the, the plant plant group, yeah, moss, P patterns. I think they have found that small RNA can be produced from these integrated loci. And that could potentially deter like incoming viral infection. But that's the only, only evidence we have so far that this has some kind of role. Yes. Um, okay, so let's... That's Let's um, take a last question on that from Felipe. Hi, Moni. Um, that was an awesome talk. Do you think that in chlorophytes, can you see some pattern of an ancient integration and genomic decay? Or do you think that they were um, all uh, most independent? So I have not presented the data, but based on our analysis, it seems like they're independent. Uh, certainly, we have integration from both. Uh, Two distinct giant virus groups that tells already that there there has been independent integration from different giant viral families. Um, however, uh, I think that goes down to the question that there are genes that are actually you know like if you have very closely related strains sequenced, you might expect that just the same integration that's been propagated in the strains. Uh, however, I believe that most of them are actually independent integration uh, from the genomic data that we have. If we sequence more similar strains, then you could have like a better idea of when they integrated and how they diversified. Um, yeah, so that's mm -hmm. like kind of very good. So, so I think we have a whole lot more um, great questions waiting. So, Moni, maybe you can try during the the, the rest of the um, yeah um, make, make a session today to answer some of these questions, or we will also help. And we, we should probably be able to post um, the questions and the answers. Um, later, also um, online on the LEGO website, so everyone um, can, can get the answers. So, yeah, I will work with I think, uh, yeah, thanks again, Monia. That was great. And thank I you very much. I hand over to Simon now. We're, we're going moving towards. Exactly. Um, so, this is everyone's favorite but a lot of information in uh, not a lot of time. And these flash talks, we will we'll have five flash talks today. And the first one, let me see, should be now. All right, hi everyone. I'm Nacho from the Extreme Virus Lab at uh, Portland State University. Today I will discuss the evolution of cruciviruses, a really cool group of DNA viruses that seem to be viral chimeras. Cruciviruses have a secret single-stranded genome that contains at least two open reading frames. One of them encodes a red protein, which is involved in the replication of secret DNA. But what makes cruciviruses so fascinating is that the capsid protein is homologous to the capsid proteins of some RNA viruses. This is the most striking evidence of relatedness between DNA and RNA viruses to date. The region of cruciviruses was hypothesized to be an RNA-DNA recombination event between members of these disparate viral groups that were infected in the same cell. However, we have now analyzed hundreds of cruciviral genomes to have a better idea of crucivirus origins. And these data suggest that alternative scenarios that can explain the presence of this capsid gene, both DNA and RNA viruses. Uh, moreover, based on our genomic data, organisms from the SAR supergroup are probably the elusive hosts of cruciviruses. So if you want to hear more, please check out my poster, come to the discussion session, or send me an email. Thank awesome. you. Awesome. Thank you.
Yeah, I, I would add a personal note that I love the Chrissy virus. It is all very, very cool. Um, okay, next one is Sejal. Hi, everyone. I'm Sejal from Center for Virus Research in the UK. And I'm going to give a brief overview of my PhD project. Um, so as we know, a typical metagenomic data analysis workflow that is shown here highlights that there are unknown sequences embedded within sequence, sequence repositories such as ENA and SRA. And these unknown contexts that do not bear any sequence similarity to known sequences are often hypothesized to belong to currently uncharacterized microorganisms. So in my PhD project, I've analyzed 963 human metagenomic samples covering 10 distinct human microbiomes, such as skin, fecal, oral, and other microbiomes from geographically diverse samples and identified over half a million of these unknown sequences, a third of which are actually protein coding. Our results show that certain human microbiomes, such as skin and oral microbiomes, contain up to 25% of these taxonomically unknown sequences that do not bear any sequence similarity to currently known sequences available in the databases. We've compared these unknown sequences originating from various microbiomes and studies and found overlap among them as well. In absence of sequence similarity, we have developed and employed a machine learning based sequence prediction framework to identify what these unknown sequences could potentially represent and our analysis show that up to 75% of these unknown sequences are of virus origin. These results are captured in more detail in our manuscript that is currently available on BioArchive. I'm happy to take any questions in the breakout room, so give me a shout. Thank you. Thank you very much. Man, that's, that's a lot of unknown viruses. Um, okay, next up is Susanna. Thank you. Um... I'm Susan Ortiz from the laboratory of Edward Holmes at the University of, of Sydney. And I'm going to start um, saying that metatranscriptomics is a powerful way to uncover the viral diversity in a sample. In this kind of analysis, we compare assembled contexts against sequences in databases using similarity search um, searches. Uh, however, this can be a limitation when we deal with divergent viruses. Um, also, there is supporting evidence suggesting that protein structure can be conserved through evolution. So in the present work, we combine protein structure prediction with uh, metatranscriptomics to analyze orphan sequences or those uh, sequences that with no significant similarity in databases um, coming from a native Australian gecko. So as a result, sorry. As a result, uh, we found a very divergent virus belonging to the family Amnoviridae, which was uh, formerly a monotypic family. And this was based on the first, on the predicted model of um, the polymerase that was very similar to the influenza virus in the order Articula virales, and the identification of conserved amino acids in this protein. Using these sequences from these novel viruses, we uh, screen additional samples from fish and TSA data sets. And as a result, we were able to identify additional relatives of these viruses, then expanding the diversity, the known diversity and the host range of the, of the family Amnoviridae and providing um, insights into the structure conservation among members of the uh, order Articula virales. Thank you very much for, to everyone. Very nice, thank you. Um, next up is Anika. Thank you, hi everyone. I'm Anika from the microbiology program at MIT. And the goal of the work that I'm pre presenting here today is to elucidate the nature of the impact of virus infection in marine microbial eukaryotes by determining changes in the communities of nucleocytoplasmic large DNA viruses on a daily time scale. So the data set that we're using to address this question is a time series of the coastal ocean north of Boston sampled daily for 93 days in a row. And we collected this material by filtering seawater onto a 0.2 micron filter. So we're looking at the cellular size fraction, which will include both giant viruses greater than 0.2 microns, as well as smaller viruses that are present inside of um, their host cells. 
And so we performed short read metagenomics on these samples, identified viral contigs in a large co-assembly based on the presence of viral marker genes, and then quantified relative abundance of each of these viruses using read mapping. And so looking to the bottom left, if we look at the fraction of the viral community accounted for by individual viruses on each day of this time series, where each line here represents one virus, we see that the dominant community members in this community are turning over rapidly on the scale of a week or so, or sometimes even days. Um, and they're rarely reappearing over the course of this time series as well. So you can see that a single color is generally not coming back later on in the time series. So nearly all of the most abundant community members that we see here are mesomimi viruses. Um, and I wanna note that phycodenoviruses, which comprise the majority of existing isolate genomes in the database, never make up more than 10% of the viral community in our data set here. So we also went on to look at host virus interactions by combining this relative abundance data with 18S amplicon sequencing over the same time series. Um, and in order to identify these novel potential virus host pairs, we selected pairs of interacting partners whose dynamics are positively correlated over long periods of time. So on the right, on top, we're looking at a 10-day sliding average of relative abundance, um, but are weekly or negatively correlated on short time scales. So the daily relative abundance, which is what we're seeing on the bottom. Um, and in this case, we're able to identify pairs such as what we're seeing here, which exhibit these really cool classic predator-prey dynamics. Um, so in conclusion, we're able to observe these neat, unique dynamics of individual NCLDVs, which can in some cases be associated with potential host dynamics as well. So thanks, and I'm happy to talk more at the breakout. Perfect, thanks. And last but not least is Thomas. Yeah, hi. Um, my name is Thomas. I'm a postdoc, computational biology mostly. Um, I work with giant viruses, uh, the hosts, eukaryotic hosts, um, but I'm particularly interested in virophages. Um, virophages to me are really special in terms of their viruses, um, but they're different because they're actually viruses of viruses, so they're not infecting really the bacterial or the eukaryotic cell, um, but they're uh, targeting the giant viruses as essentially their hosts. Um, so in the past, we've shown that a virophage can enter a eukaryotic host cell, but it cannot replicate. What it does, it usually integrates into the host genome and it waits for a giant virus to infect the same cell. Only if the cell is infected and the giant virus sets up its replication machinery, then the virophage is reactivated from the genome and it hijacks the giant virus uh, virion factory, so the replication machinery, the pseudo organelle that they set up. It's a really co a cool uh, idea, a real, really cool how nature always comes up with this uh, exploitation of exploitation of uh, parasitism and all that. Um, we're particularly interesting now to understand how widespread the system is. And we're looking for the presence of new virophages in various eukaryotic genomes um, to understand if this is like really an adaptive defense system because whenever virophages take over giant virus reproduction machineries, they reduce virus pressure in those populations and they can be protected populations. This is a very interesting system. We found quite a lot. Um, if you want to hear more about it, so feel free to look at my poster um, or come. Thank you. And that is all for the flash talks. Thanks a lot for the, uh, to the five presenters who agreed very generously to be the first one to try this format and, and uh, kind of bravely decided to take this on. Um, this was awesome. I love this one. Um, remember, for everyone, you can meet and discuss with all the presenters and also post our presenters who uh, elected to not give flash talks in the breakout session after this webinar. And now, in the meantime, I will hand it over to Frederick again for the next speaker and the second main talk of this. Yeah, thanks again, everyone, for the great flash talks. That was really like a lot of exciting science I already heard about. And I'm curious how, how this, most of these projects are going to play out. Um, um, yeah, our next speaker, as, as someone said, is uh, Shannon Bennett. Shannon is at the California Academy of Sciences. Um, which is in the beautiful Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. Um, there she is um, Chief of Science and Hint Dean of Science and um, Research Collections. She's also a Patterson Scholar and um, Associate Curator of Microbiology. Um, Shannon, she studies infectious diseases that, um, which are transmitted from animals to humans. And um, she's also interested in the impact on global health. 
Um, she was on several expeditions around the world, um, particularly in Africa, to study dengue. And I remember um, yeah, that she has indeed uh, many exciting stories to tell. Um, hi, Shannon. Um, yeah, the stage is yours. Thank you, Frederick. That was a good introduction. I'm going to uh, share my screen. And uh, I'm really excited uh, to be here today. Um, Hold on, where is my screen? There. Okay. Good. So uh, I'm, as Frederick said, I'm at a natural history museum. And uh, as such, I am uh, definitely uh, surrounded by ancient forms of, of, of hosts. So I, I really think about all living uh, uh, things as, as potential hosts. And we've heard a lot about viruses of even viruses. So, so we, we recognize that things can, can host many forms of viruses. And uh, you could argue that at a natural history museum, we have a very broad array of hosts that go back in time quite a bit. So if anybody wants to collaborate on looking at ancient viruses through time series across uh, different forms of life, uh, mostly um, eukaryotic life, then let me know. So uh, can everybody see my screen okay? Yeah. All right, I'm assuming yes. So um, I really want to, great. So I, I'm uh, very interested in, the, in exploring viral diversity in, um, in eukaryotes and I use mosquitoes to help me do this. So this is, a, this is an image of a mosquito, the friendly mosquito taking a blood meal from a vertebrate. I happen to be the model in this picture. It's taking a blood meal from, from me. And um, the mosquito really concentrates the intersections of different parts of, of natural systems. It, it, um, the female uh, lays her eggs in water. So she interacts with, with, uh, with water and that microbiome. She uh, takes blood sometimes from multiple different kinds of vertebrates or multiple individuals within a species of vertebrate. And um, then the mosquito has their own microbiome. So the intersection of, of many different environmental sections of genetic information come together in the mosquito hindgut in that beautiful red um, abdomen that you can see pictured here. So uh, at the uh, California Academy of Sciences, I'm, I come from a background of deep interest in emerging infectious diseases and in viruses that cause diseases in humans and affiliated animals. But um, now that I'm at the Cal Academy, I'm really broadening my focus to think about the distribution of viruses in natural systems and how the biodiversity of um, across these systems from, from the eukaryotes, the vertebrates, all the way down to the bacteria and the viruses and other microorganisms are all interrelated and how the diversity might impact uh, the um, outbreaks of emerging infectious diseases or the emergence of those diseases, viruses that cause diseases. So to ask this question, we've been, we, we, we're posing a hypothesis. The hypothesis or the question is, does biodiversity reduce the risk of emerging infectious diseases? And so we took advantage uh, in partnership with some colleagues of a landscape gradient in Thailand. And, and those, that landscape gradient is pictured on the top. And our hypothesis in specifically is, I'm gonna show next is here. And that is that Biodiversity can be sort of captured across this landscape gradient as highly biodiverse in forested environments, all the way through to very non-diverse in urban environments. And if you translated that into transmission arenas, you, you might see on the far uh, left top, that transmission arenas and forests are very complex. There are many different vertebrate hosts, many different mosquito vectors, for example, all the way through to urban environments where you might have a monoculture of humans, um, anthropophilic species like rats and cockroaches and crows, and then a few invasive mosquitoes that take advantage of the urban environment, like the common house mosquito, Culex uh, kinka fasciatus, or um, Aedes aegypti. And so then if you sort of tried to quantify that biodiversity across these landscapes, I've done that in the gray bars. So the gray histograms represent the relative abundance of different kinds of species of hosts or vectors, all the, from very biodiverse in the forest to one single tall bar in the urban environments. And then within those are colored bars and those represent the microbial diversity. And so 
the question or the hypothesis is, does the distribution, the diversity of the vectors or the vertebrate hosts in these sectors impact the microbial diversity, either within hosts or across a host community? And so you might say in the forest community, there are many different um, co colored bars representing different species of microbes and they have different, they have a similar relative abundances. But when you move into urban or suburban environments, you see a, a big red bar, which basically represents an outbreak, a monoculture of a microbe that has uh, the evolutionary potential and the ecological opportunity to track a monoculture of a host or an invasive vector. So to test this hypothesis, we um, used our very friendly mosquito. So we went out and we collected mosquitoes. We've collected mosquitoes from many kinds of environments. I believe in bringing family in. So this is my daughter fishing in a toilet, abandoned toilet for on the far left for, for mosquito larvae. And there we are sampling different kinds of environments, a rice paddy in the middle, uh, a forest, a, a jungle setting in Thailand in the top. Uh, and we take the mosquito, the mosquito that was uh, the model in the first image, she eventually passed out and that's her on a leaf on the far right. Uh, she was fine, we popped her in a tube, but the mosquitoes in general, we bring to the lab and we sequence them. And at the beginning we were doing amplicon sequencing on a 454 machine. Um, all, now we're doing total RNA uh, shotgun sequencing. So in Thailand, we sampled these different environments and we did indeed see uh, as our hypothesis uh, predicted that the mosquito diversity changes dramatically across landscapes. And what happens is as you get into those urban environments, not only does the diversity shift, but the mosquito communities become hyper dominated by invasive mosquito species. So this is a, these are all the mosquitoes that we found. Uh, the, the ones that are invasive happen to also be uh, well-known, well-characterized vectors of disease, and they increase with habitat degradation as you move from forest to urban environments. So that basically means that we see, so across the top, we have forest, forest fragment, rural, uh, RU, RF is um, rice fields, suburban, and urban. And so basically, as you move across the landscape or across the table from left to right, you end up uh, having higher uh, relative abundances of invasive mosquitoes that are also disease vectors. So what we wanted to do really though was understand how those mosquitoes, how their microbiomes might change across these landscapes. So are their um, viromes more diverse? Are their bacteria and other archaea and other microbes more diverse as you move across these landscapes? So we started to take a, a sequencing approach. I, again, I said, I mentioned we used some 454 technologies, RNA shotgun technologies, and I'm gonna show you both, um, both the ones in, with a, the orange arrows and the ones with the green arrows and what those microbiomes tell us about uh, landscape gradients. So uh, the first uh, focus that we took was on our 80s aegypti pool. Uh, we also looked at Culex, Culex kinka fasciatus and Aedes albopictus and saw similar patterns, though not as clean. So uh, with Aedes aegypti, we definitely saw that um, microbial bi di biodiversity based on 16S amplicon sequencing showed that OTUs were more diverse in rural environments and less in urban environments. We also found that depending on the kind of habitat, whether it was urban on the far left um, or rural on the right for a given species, that we, uh, we basically saw a big shift in the community. So these are the major bacteria uh, groups by both species and habitat. Uh, the takeaway is that the microbiome is different both by species, but even within a species, it can vary across habitats. Uh, this is similar to um, with the, uh, the eukaryotic groups, definitely very distinct across species, but we couldn't really get much uh, resolution within species because uh, the data was pretty sparse. But in general, uh, and if you look at this slide, it's giving us uh, the 16S information, but sorted by habitat and specifically pulling out a heat map of the different groups. And um, the more rural, less urbanized environments across the top are in dark green. And you can kind of see a lot more diversity, more um, spots 
that show some level of um, abundance in those rural environments. So these are mosquitoes that don't actually occur in forest fragments. Rural is about as wild as they get. What was interesting was it allowed us to identify some uh, different uh, fr uh, strains of Wolbachia, which is a very uh, significant bacterium in mosquitoes and uh, in uh, may have implications for um, vector con for controlling the vector competence of uh, Aedes aegypti in particular. In terms of the eukaryotes, we also found that um, the diversity was very species specific, but also ranged across habitat with many rural communities having a lot more diversity. And we did find that um, some bacteria like Asco, uh, some eukaryotes like Asco gregorina was, um, was discovered in a system that might help actually promote um, vector competence. So Bulbachia may uh, uh, reduce vector competence, but Asco gregorina can improve it. So lots of potential interactions to dig into, but I really wanna talk more about the viruses. So we then delved into some other mosquitoes that, um, and I'll, I'll talk about some of the known viruses that we uncovered and new ones in a final slide. But in, um, in terms of the virus diversity across uh, these habitats, we picked three other mosquito species to dive into. And in these cases, you can see at a glance that many of the virus groups are very different, very species specific. And even within species, there's some landscape uh, variation in terms of the viral community structure. Uh, that was a similar pattern that we saw with bacterial structure that the different groups, the different species of, our, of mosquito definitely had different bacterial communities. And to some extent, these did vary across habitats. So when we tried to do a principal components analysis to understand what was really um, driving the structure of the virome or the bacterium across uh, both species and habitats, we found that viruses are actually much, the viromes are much more structured by host species. And that's probably no surprise to anybody that studies viruses. They're pretty intertwined and host specific in many cases. So in this case, the colors represent the species of vector, the shapes represent the habitats. With uh, the bacteria, it's not as clear. Uh, there's not really a strong pattern either by uh, species or a uh, vector species or by habitat. So I wanted to just touch on some of the uh, viruses that we did find. So uh, these are this is a phylogenetic tree, several phylogenetic trees, sorry, of some of the viruses that we found. They're all highlighted in red. And many of them, you can see several virus species in, in the Flaviviridae. You can see viruses associated in the Narnaviridae um, and the Notaviridae. So many, many different species. All, almost all of them, if they were, um, if we were able to identify them, clustered with other um, known mosquito viruses. And so we didn't actually uncover too many novel um, vertebrate viruses, but rather many, many novel mosquito viruses. We had a similar um, pattern in negative sense single-stranded RNA viruses in which we discovered many uh, viruses that were associated with other known mosquito viruses. Um, and those are shown across several different groups, including uh, the Bunia virales. So um, one of the things that uh, when you take the information from from these studies altogether. And I've studied, I've highlighted a few of the families and, or other groups of viruses that, uh, that have been, um, that we've contributed to through this work. And um, what's uh, striking to me is that many of the virus groups that do have pathogens, and I've marked all the known pathogens of vertebrates here with a skull and crossbones, actually have affiliated uh, viruses in mosquitoes. And the ones that we've recovered in, in these various mosquito studies in Thailand, um, as well as a few more here in California are highlighted in yellow. And um, what's a very interesting uh, question that our lab is, is now pursuing is, is there a, a common uh, evolutionary pathway for many of the vertebrate uh, viral viruses that cause diseases in vertebrates through 
um, mosquitoes as vectors or through an evolutionary history with blood feeding or even phytophagous insects. So that, that would be something really cool with the power of, of the mosquito as an intersection of um, many different ecosystems as well as uh, metagenomics and next gen sequencing allows us to now explore. So we were really excited. Uh, we recently uh, received with a, with a group at UC Berkeley under Eva Harris, a grant to, to explore the ecological uh, virome of many different uh, natural and human systems. So these are, this is a grant focused on con contrasting rural and urban environments specifically in three different countries, Nicaragua, Ecuador, and Sri Lanka, to try to explore the virome of um, not only mosquitoes, humans, but other vertebrates in the system. So we'll be uh, sharing hopefully more with everybody that grant just came through in August. And we haven't been able to do any field work because of COVID, but we hope to start that very soon. So um, I just wanted to conclude by um, summarizing uh, the, there is a diversity of viral forms in natural systems. Uh, they are often related to known pathogens, demonstrating that there are constant, consistent, possibly consistent evolutionary pathways between viruses that infect mosquitoes and viruses that cause emerge to cause diseases and vertebrates. Um, Mosquito microbiomes contain many um, microbial partners that might interact with viruses that can impact either by upregulating or downregulating um, vector competence. Mosquito diversity varies across landscapes in ways that might mitigate viral disease emergence. So where mosquito communities are more diverse, there are less invasive mosquitoes that vector disease. And similarly, mos mosquito microbiomes also vary across landscapes. However, uh, the host distribution strongly determines the distribution, at least in terms of viromes across landscapes. And with that, I wanna acknowledge, uh, this is, I'll just say that my lab here, I wanna acknowledge all of my lab uh, members and collaborators and, um, and these uh, funders. And with that, I'll take questions. Thank you, Shannon. That was a great talk. I'm um, exciting. So, so um, looking at the Q&A, so we, we're waiting for questions to come in um, from the audience. So, so I have one question. You, you um, showed the overview with the um, 16S and 18S, like the bacteria that you detected with the mosquitoes and also the 18S that you detected. And we see like Bulbachia, like clearly like host associated um, microbes there, which makes perfectly sense. But you also found some 18S sequences of maybe micro eukaryotes in there. So I'm curious when you now look into the viruses, if some of the viruses that you detect are in fact not infecting um, the mosquito, but in fact infecting the associated uh, micro eukaryotes from the mosquito microbiome. Yeah. Yes. Uh Absolutely. Um, so there, there. I didn't have time to talk about it, but there were several um, um, viruses that appeared to be viruses of, of fungi that were pulled out of our of our of our system. We're working with a collaborator at Stanford to try to characterize the fungi better to then help characterize those viruses better. Um, we also found many microbes that were associated with other microbes. So we had a. a uh, dirofilarial nematode infection, which accounted uh, for several of the Wolbachia instances. And I'm sure that that would um, be true of many of the viruses as well. But it's a great, great question. Yeah, that's good. Um, thanks. So I see one question came from the audience. So are there um, fitness costs um, to being a vector? Uh, so it, that's actually a really, it's a good question and a hard one to, to answer. And if you measure fitness cost by, um, by number of eggs, as well as how long the female lives, we have preliminary evidence that there is a fitness cost for hosting flaviviruses. We've only done this work on the flavies um, and on dengue in, in particular. It's a very subtle fitness cost though, and it seems to be higher depending on the species. So exam for example, it was pretty high in the 80s Albopictus and 80s Aegypti, but not really detectable in Culex species. So uh, that work is in, in prep. That's a great question. There has been, um, you know, one of the justifications for potentially using um, 
uh, modified forms of Wolbachia introduced into Aedes aegypti to control dengue is that maybe there would be a fitness advantage to Aedes aegypti for, uh, for um, hosting these Wolbachia strains. And uh, in the insect kingdom writ large, Wolbachia often has a negative fitness impact. So it's an interesting question to compare the fitness benefit of hosting a Wolbachia strain as um, mitigating viral infections that could have a negative fitness consequence. Thank you for the detailed answer of the question. That was great. Um, any other question from, from the audience? If, if not, um, I, I think uh, I oh, actually one more came in. So that's from Severin. Okay. So um, Shannon, could you pick up any animal sequences from the mosquito feed? And if so, did you see any correlations between type of feed host and bacteria or viruses? So actually we, we were able to, to pick up some signal from, from blood from blood fed mosquitoes. We separated visually blood fed mosquitoes from non blood fed mosquitoes and um, detected um, blood, uh, blood, you know, blood characteristics, but it was very, it was not very non precise at the time. So we, we basically couldn't really tell with much precision uh, whether the mosquito had say fed on, on a water buffalo or, um, uh, a cow. So we didn't have too much precision. We could definitely tell that it was not, we could tell the difference between something that was feeding on birds or lizards versus on ungulates versus on humans, but we didn't get um, much more precise than that. Uh, that work is definitely ongoing and uh, something we're really interested in exploring. Great, thank you. Um, I think I hand over to Simon now. Great, thank you. Thank you, Frederick. Um, and yeah, thanks for or thanks to all the presenters for you know fantastic talks, all the main talks and the flash talks. I um, also want to thank all the co-organizer of this seminar series and of course the support staff, especially Brooke and Debbie for setting all the logistics. Now, if you would like to discuss and chat more with all the presenters, you know, main talks, flash talks, posters. Here is the short URL to join the next, you know, breakout session um, Zoom meeting where you will be able to talk and, and more informally discuss. And with that, um, you know, we can officially close this first webinar. Remember that there are six uh, of this seminar. So if you like this one today, please join us for the next five. Thank you.